Henrietta Knight. race country, I'm off to meet Henrietta Knight, trainer of the legendary Best Mate. This is it, and he goes. It's the moment of truth for Charlie as the hammer falls at the breeze up sails. And we're up on the gallops with former England footballer and racehorse trainer Mick Shannon. Good afternoon and welcome to race country. This is the peaceful setting of the Blowing Stone pub, about five miles from Lambourne, which is run by the former jump jockey, Luke Harvey. We'll be meeting him later in the programme. But first, we're off to Henrietta Knight's yard, where one of her stable staff has his mind clearly set on success. A few miles north of Lambourne is the West Lock Inch Yard, where Henrietta's stable staff are busy with their evening chores. Jonathan Jarrett, known to his friends as JJ, has four horses to muck out, feed and groom twice a day. Now 18, JJ has worked with horses most of his life. I think I had my first pony when I was about six weeks old, I think. I didn't really take it seriously until I was about seven or eight, I don't think. Before that, I was always going to be, be a footballer or snooker player or something like that. Now, though, he's desperate to be a top professional jockey, but he has just one problem. He's not short. Yeah, my height has been a bit of a problem. I've always been pretty tall. Um, I'm 18 now and I'm about six foot two, six foot two and a half, so I'm probably still growing, but at the end of the day, there's nothing I can do about it, so... Hopefully I won't get much taller and I don't get much fatter either. <laughs> JJ is already too big to turn professional, but at 12 stone he can still ride in amateur races. The next big date in the calendar is the local Old Berkshire point to point. JJ has lined himself up with five rides, including two for local amateur trainer Roger Wernham. Trainer and jockey use their spare time to school the horses over some practice fences. These horses wouldn't have jumped since they last ran. This is really just to get their eye in, to, you know, just to make sure that they know what they're doing on Monday and they go and pop and jump. Roger isn't worried about JJ's build and even sees it as an advantage. Well, he's a big lad, but at the moment he's light. If he fills out, it's going to be a problem. But at the moment, I should think it's an advantage because he can wrap his legs around and give a horse a very good ride. Over the fences is Father Andy, one of JJ's best hopes for victory at the point to point. Racing a horse is brilliant. It's kind of like being on a roller coaster. You have ups and downs, and if you get a good horse that really jumps well and you know really takes you along and pulls you along, it's great. Yeah, happy enough with that. Yeah. The unpaid work is done, so he's back to the day job. Just have a, those backward ones just want to go at the back. In West Ilsley, further up the valley from Lambourne, is Mick Shannon's yard. Silver touch. She sweat a bit, does she, in the mornings? Just have to whip her rugs off then, will you? He trains horses to race on the flat, and since it's the start of the season, his workload is picking up. OK, we'll go out next time. It's 5.30 a.m., and his protégés are heading for the gallops. Mick owns the largest training yard in the area. It's home to 160 thoroughbreds. Um, mainly two-year-olds, you know, I expect that I mean, that's part of 100 two-year-olds, you know, but uh, early on in the season, you just hope you've got a superstar, you know. But, um, we live in the dream factory, don't we? Mick has been training horses for 16 years, and in that time, he's had hundreds of winners. But he's so modest about his success. All right, I'm the name on the, on, on the paper, you know, and Mick Shannon trains them, but what I'm trying to say, I don't train them. There's 55 lads here training them, and, uh, and that's what it's about. It's about a team, you know, so it's all working together, and not only have you got, uh, have you got to work as a team, you know, all the lads that work with us, but you've got to get the best out of, uh, of the horses as well, you know. He's been hugely successful, but there are targets still to hit, such as training a classic winner. 
I think that that's what we're all looking for. You know, we all got this belief that we can find that absolute gem, which is. Uh, which is probably the best racehorse in the world, you know, and uh, it just drives you on. It gets you up in the morning. It gets you, you know, why do we get up at sort of, you know, four, five, six o'clock in the morning through the summer? Because we're, you know, it's it's exciting. You know, you don't know. You wake up in the morning and who knows, you might all of a sudden have an absolute superstar on your hand. So the question is always there for him. Could there be a superstar in the making on the gallops this morning? That big keen? She's not lame though, is she? And if there is, he should recognise it. Mick is no stranger to stardom himself. In the 70s, he was a top professional footballer. Well, the unpredictability of, of training horses is very similar to football. You know, how do, you know, how do Man United lose to, to Norwich, who, who are bottom of the league and they're top of the league almost? But, you know, and, and, and where does a good racehorse come from? Nobody knows, and it's, I, mean, I think it's that, that mystique, that little bit of magic. I was fortunate that my footballing career was great fun and, and winning the FA Cup was probably one of the high moments of it. I mean, playing for England and captaining your country was another great honour, which uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to do. But um, one day when the, you know, nobody wanted Mick Shannon to play football though, and the phone wasn't ringing you know, for anything else, I thought, well, I better get off my ass and do something. So I started training a few horses. I must have been so naive, I can't believe it. But anyway, we started and, you know, here we are 15 years down the line, you know, in probably one of the most famous racing yards in the country, for sure. Um, and um, we're still seeking that elusive classic winner and let's hope in the next few years we find it. And try them on! As we know, the village of Lambourne rises early. The racing world is unaccustomed to lions. And in another corner of the valley, Luke Harvey is up with the lark. He's the racing tipster for BBC Radio's Five Live. I normally get up about sort of half past five, drive to Lambourne, get the papers, go through you know, the, the daily papers and also, of course, the Racing Post. And so I get all the up-to-date going. It's terribly important with horses. Some horses like fast ground, some horses like soft ground. And uh, so it's a key thing. So although it sounds terribly boring, if you're not interested in horses, it, it, it is very significant. I used to have to go into London. Well, I used to get up at sort of 20 to 4 every day, drive into a broadcasting house and actually do my bulletins from there. But um, luckily, <laughs> I've now got my, actually, my um, ISDN kit. It, it's absolutely ideal because I can get the up-to-date information from all the stables in the local area and, um, and then broadcast it literally as I hear it. Live news, live sport. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. Alistair, thanks so much indeed. Luke, for some racing, good morning. Good morning, Brian. Yes, it's uh, rather subdued today, considering yesterday was the last day of the jump season. But uh, let's talk about today's meetings, because there are three of them. They go up bright on the ground. They're good for ten past two start. If you've never been to Brighton before, really friendly little track, worth going along. Now, cue the music trained by Mick Shannon. I think that has an excellent chance. That one runs in a 3.20. They also go today at Ludlow. Again, another very friendly track. Good ground there. It's a two o'clock start for them. I saw Mick Fitzgerald last night. Sancerre, I think, has an excellent chance. But the best bet of the day, I think, is Rift Valley in the 4.20 at Ludlow. Luke, many thanks. Bingo, that's it. Luke is a well-known face in and around Labourne. Between his broadcasting commitments, he runs a local pub, the Blowing Stone. Like everywhere else in the area, racing plays a part there too. When we took the pub on, we thought we'd just do something a bit different. And, and unlike so a lot of places where they have some pictures of people winning. We got some, we got some really funny ones. Uh, this is Richard Dunwoody <laughs> crashing for there. It's a really nice, you know, community pub, but um, it does get quite wild <laughs> at times. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder, people can't believe I get up to do five live, but um, I do, most of the time. I quite often cook fry-ups for the residents and what have you, and um, I'd never cooked even a boiled egg until I started here, and... Um, quite proud of my fry-ups now. You know, running a pub, as well as doing the broadcasting, can, can be fairly demanding, but um, it's, it's all good fun. That is a Blowingstone fry-up. 
Luke has lived in Lambourne for 25 years, and like many youngsters who flocked to the area, he started out in a racing yard. Because I was fairly small at school, all I ever wanted to do was be a jockey. But just as well, because I was sick as a plank, I couldn't have, didn't have many other options. But I went to work for uh, the late Captain Forster. And uh, I think I can honestly say, in those sort of three or four years that I was there from 16 till 19, uh, I think they're probably the best years of my life. Luke managed to fulfil his dream at Captain Forster's and became a professional jump jockey. I was run of the mill, you know, I, I, my best year I rode 48 winners or something, which to me I was over the moon, absolutely thrilled about. I think probably my proudest moments when I won on a horse called Cool Ground, he, he won the Welsh Grand National and uh, just a, a marvellous day, he was gambled off the boards and he, and he won very easily. Victory wasn't always his, however, and Luke bears plenty of battle scars from races that didn't quite go according to plan. Yeah, I've broken this collarbone, I don't know, six, seven times. I've broken this one even more. I've had a piece of it taken out. I've broken the ball off the end of my arm, dislocated my shoulder, elbow. I, it sounds quite sort of heroic, but it's, I can assure you I'm the biggest sissy there is. Um, it, you know, it's a dangerous sport, but it's a sport when you've got danger involved, that seems to bind people together. <laughs> that is certainly true of Luke and his former colleagues from Captain Forster's. Luke has organised a reunion this afternoon. The veterans aren't saddling up, though. They're playing it safe with a football match in the neighbouring village. We'll play three across the middle, right? You can sit and sit. We're so fat and unfit, it's just gonna be, it, it should be a really fun afternoon. It's back to the blowing stone for some refreshments and post-match analysis. It was a real good laugh, but a total embarrassment. I don't know. I, think it, I don't think it helps having 15 people on the, in the second half. I think we played better when we had the right member. Great to see all the boys again. Just such a such a laugh. Already just some of the stories that they're coming out with that when we were there. <laughs> Screeching, you can hear over there. That's not a cockerel or a goose or a duck, although it could be because they've got all sorts of animals here. That is Henrietta Knight, the woman who's trained best mate to win three Cheltenham Gold Cups and who now is doing her best impression of a mother hen as she rounds up the horses that had turned out in this field. Come on! Hen, hello. Hello, Claire. How surprising to find you in the middle of the field. <laughs> I'm just checking them all over, all the babies. I'm asleep this morning. How old are these? Um, they're four-year-olds and three-year-olds. We're all just having their lovely summer holidays. So this is the, the raw material that hopefully will turn into a best mate or an that's what, we, that's what we hope. They haven't ever seen a race course yet. And they're um, just having the summer out, then they'll start to come into work and do something positive. And is there anything that you can see in the way they are in the field that gives you any sort of clue as to what they might be like? Well, you do definitely get a pecking order in the field. There's five of them out here, and you definitely get the ones that are the boss, um, and the ones who are a bit timid, and the ones that are definitely braver. He's a bit more suspicious. He's always snorting at things. So once they finish the summer sunbathing and biting each other and playing, what, what happens then? Uh, well, when this um, lovely holiday comes to an end, they come back into the stable and they get rebroken. And they start again and they start getting fit and um, learning to go in with each other on the gallops, probably with an older horse. So they get a bit of a lead on the gallop and um, just grade it maturing a bit further. But it's not all relaxation at West Lockinch Farm. Back 
back at Henrietta's yard, there's another youngster being put through his paces. This is um, a young horse we've got doing a bit of what some people would call it dressage. We just call it sort of suppling up flat work to sort of build up more muscles in their back lines and get them obedient and twist and turn and sort of gymnastic exercises, really. So g given that most trainers just concentrate on making a horse go as fast as possible and jump as fast as possible, are you here trying to find an edge by doing something a bit different? Well, we, I sort of believe, because I came more from a venting background, that the horse to be really fit and be able to jump well, and jumping is the name of the game in national hunt racing, it's got to have all its muscles developed right and be able to uh, be very supple and athletic. She's working him down with his head and bending and really developing the muscles along his back. Yeah, you can see him just start to stretch down mm. there with his head rather mm. than coming up. This is a pioneering approach to schooling a racehorse, but one that clearly works. Henrietta, along with her husband, ex-jockey Terry Biddlecombe, have trained nearly 600 winners. Among them, of course, best mate. Because we've done quite a lot of this work with best mate over the years, apparently in a couple of places in Ireland, they've started, in Ireland of all places, they've started um, some dressage clinics for racehorses. Oh, brilliant. Somebody's cashed in on the idea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It takes hours and hours of hard work to train a young horse to compete with the big boys when it's old enough. There's another schooling ring at West Lockinge which also sees a lot of action, as this is where Henrietta gives her potential national hunt racehorses their first taste of jumping. Now they're bringing a horse up here today who's never jumped before, never seen anything like it, so consequently <laughs> just putting the poles down so they're nice and low. But still give him something to take him off the ground. And can you tell pretty quickly whether they are natural jumpers? Yes, we can. Some just take to it like ducks to water. We lead them over the, first, over the pole the first time, and so they get used to following the, the person who's leading them, and then, and then we send them round loose. You just sort of go into a little bit of a trot when you've passed me, and then keep, if you go as well, keep going. Good boy. Okay. That was very easy. Yeah. And he hasn't jumped ever, this horse. Good boy. Okay, okay, Vicky, you can loose him off. I don't think he's going to be frightened of anything. Go on, big horse. It's amazing how fast they go when they're allowed to go their own speed. Go on. Oh, whack that. Not very clever, that wasn't. Because he's such a big horse, we're going to put the jump bigger. Because otherwise, he hardly notices it, and then he's going to get into bad habits just galloping through it. Well, just to sort of make him concentrate more? Yeah. It won't really help the matter if he does knock it a bit. You might make him pick his feet up a bit better. Because he's so big, he makes the jump look so small. They don't want what down on yours. And can you see them start to teach themselves? Yes, I mean, you could see a few of the mistakes he was making there, and he did jump one off all fours, and then he, the next time round, he, he measured it. Ooh. Gosh, he does think this is easy. Good boy. He took off a bit far away there. Go on. Ooh, that's the trot. Did he make a nice Good boy. If he jumps this one nice, that'll be enough for him today. Yeah. Poor oh boy, he, he was a model pupil because they aren't usually as quick to learn the first time up here. So for a first ever experience of jumping, how many marks out of ten would you give him? I'd say he'd get eight and a half for that one. It's pretty well, pretty good, I mean, nearly as good as we've had up here. And that is praise indeed from one of the country's most successful jumping trainers. Could we have another best mate on our hands? It's the morning of the old barks point to point, and one of Henrietta's stable lads is hoping to make headlines of his own. JJ walks the course with his girlfriend Carly, and the tallest jockey in town has his heart set on success. Basically, just seeing, seeing what the course is like, see what the ground's like, see where I've got to go, what I've got to jump. I'd want to be well making a move by this point. Just say we've got to go around this bend, next bend. 
and it's pretty much a run down the home straight there to the finish. Oh, yeah. JJ is competing in five races. Each of them is three miles long with 18 fences, and the first one is about to start. There are a few last minute instructions from Roger, the horse's trainer. If they go mad, JJ, ride a race the first circuit and then see if you get his jumping working second lot. I think it's your only chance, you know. See, he's on. Horse looks well. It's just set for the best. Starts and JJ makes sure he has a clear view of the first fence. Come on, Jay. After the first circuit, JJ has moved up to make the running and has victory in his sights. Very well. Just hope that they're not going too quick. Start putting the pressure on there. There's only one fence to jump, but the horses disappear from the spectators' view. So all Carly and Roger can do is wait to see where JJ emerges at the final bend. Come on. No. Uh, no, it's There's no sign of horse or jockey as the leaders head towards the finish. JJ has pulled up after hearing Father Andy struggle with his breathing. And, um, yeah. Just in that dip there. Just, just and pulled up and just oh, okay. And if that wasn't enough, there's disappointment for JJ in the next three races too. If he's going to catch the eye of the many trainers here and prove himself as a serious contender on the amateur circuit, he needs to shine in his last race. However, girlfriend Carly has doubts about Jules' son, the horse he's chosen to ride. Yeah. Probably wouldn't be the best of his chances today, but we shall see. JJ gets a solid start and is not far off the leaders on the inside. By the end of the first circuit, JJ is challenging at the front. He's doing well, yeah. He's also jumping well for him. JJ can ride back into the enclosure with a smile on his face. Well done. <laughs> and he's one step closer to his dream of becoming a top amateur jockey. the manager of Kingwood Stud, has been in Newmarket for two days attending the Tattersall's annual breeze-up sales. Hello for a jockey. This year, he has four two-year-olds to sell, one of which is owned by the family business. Potential buyers have been given the opportunity to see the horses in action on the race course, but yesterday, the serious business of buying and selling began. Owners, trainers and bloodstock agents from all over the world have been trying to outbid each other for the horses that impress them most. But so far for Charlie, the sale has been disappointing. Um, last night was a bit tricky and patchy, but we've got some better, better quality horses tonight, so we will hope for the best. Sorry. Yesterday he sold two horses on behalf of clients, but they didn't make as much as expected. The horses that sold last night were a little bit disappointing. They didn't breathe as fast as some horses have breathed, and subsequently they didn't make as high prices as other horse, as some of the other horses in the sale. Tonight, he's hoping for a reversal of fortunes. One of the two remaining horses to go under the hammer is the Mr. Bailey's Colt, owned by Kingwood Stud itself. We bought him originally as a foal for 18,000, and then last year, 
the yearling sales we thought 28,000 wasn't enough for him, which is why we bought him back. So we'd be hoping for somewhere in the region of 40,000 pounds for him. But you don't know at this stage how, how big their checkbooks are or how far they're prepared to put their hand into their pocket. So all we know is that there's lots of interest in him and he would be the one our main hopes would be pinned on. With the stakes so high, Charlie's mother and stud owner Fiona Mana has travelled down to give moral support. Yes, perhaps we go straight in the ring now, do you think we'll be well, too Well, we're full? with this too full. Yes. They've all just been got ready now to go up to the ring, so there's nothing else, much more we can do now we're in the lap of the gods. And, um, you know, they breezed well yesterday, so we well, on Tuesday, and so we just keep our fingers crossed. Ten lots before the horses are up for auction, they're entered into the parade ring. This is the last opportunity for potential buyers to check out the merchandise. If a horse starts misbehaving now, he can undo, he can undo all the good work that's already been done. Inside the sales house, the auction is in full swing. In horse sales, bids are traditionally made in guineas, each being worth one pound and five pence, and the extra five p's make up the five percent commission of the auction house. Back in the parade ring, the Mr. Bailey's colt has behaved impeccably, and his moment of truth has arrived. So this is it, and he goes. Thanks. One, six, three now. Horse in training inside by Kingwood Stud. A real smashing colt, this. Half brother to a winner, but he's a cracker. Lovely, lovely horse. What'll you bid me for him? There's no reserve, you know, he goes. At 28 bid again now, 20 at 30,000 now. 32, 32 bid. At 30, Having bought the horse for 18,000 pounds, Charlie and Fiona were hoping to make around 40,000 in tonight's auction. At 40, where are we now? At 42, 42 bid. At 42, 45, 45 now. At 45. The price is already above what they had hoped for, and it's still rising. At 75 now. At 75, 80. 80,000, 80,000 now, at 90,000, bid again last time, at 90,000. Mr. Yoshida, 90,000 buys and thank you. Excellent result. One, six, four. Horse in training and signed by Kingwood Stud. In the following lot, their final horse makes a modest 36,000 guineas. But tonight's success story was the Mr. Bailey's colt, owned until a few moments ago by the family business. Mr. Bailey's was obviously an absolutely fantastic sale. So, you know, we bought him originally for 18,000, and so, you know, to get 90,000 really is sort of beyond your wildest dreams. It's a great, great sale all round. Well done, Emmy. Once the hammer falls, ownership transfers immediately from seller to buyer, and with it, responsibility for the yeah. horse. You want to take a photograph now, or yes, he's back in the stable. He's now the property of um, Mr. Yoshida. We obviously bring him back to the stable here, make sure he's got food for the night and water, and he'll be on his way to Japan. Yeah, sad to see him go. He's been a very good. He's been a very good servant to us, obviously at that and. I yeah, wish him all the best and hope he goes on and has a very successful racing career. On the next race country, I'll be taking a walk down memory lane with Lambourne's octogenarian stable lad. And it's drinks all round to toast another new arrival at Kingwood Stud. Tonight.